The level of income or equity you created depends on the time and effort you put into this whole thing. There is no instant financial freedom. It just doesn't work that way. But I always had my eye on the ball in terms of financial freedom. Never steal from yourself. Never rob your storage. Future you has to be the number one bill. You're listening to the Real Estate Runway podcast powered by Quattro Capital, where we're all about alternative business and investment strategies to help you amplify life and maximize wealth. Here's your host, Mo the Connector. Today's episode is a single sode, if you will. I wanted to talk to you about breaking the money rat race and how I did it. If you follow me on social media, if you've heard me talk to other guests on the podcast, I frequently talk about my financial freedom journey, why it was so important, why it really had nothing to do with money. It had everything to do with being able to control my time so I could, uh, so I could plug into planet and earth as intended and have experiences and build relationships and things of that nature. Um, But breaking the money rat race is interesting. No one talks about it coming out of college, right? You would think a professor or guidance counselors in high school or whatever would teach you the number one fundamental skill, which is the purpose of you getting that degree is so you can use that degree to get a salary, but then you take it one step further. The purpose of getting a salary is such that you can create income, meaning You use that salary to buy assets. It can be real estate. It can be dividend stocks. It can be anything. It could be intellectual property. It could be building a business. But you want to use that salary to create perpetual income streams that last a lifetime. And that's what I did. So I'm going to talk to you today a little bit about why I did that and how I did that. And hopefully it helps you on your journey. Um, I'm going to take you back to when I was 15 years old. My father sent me on a trip to France. The previous summer, uh, a kid by the name of Matthew stayed with me. He was an exchange student from Paris. My father, knowing that I was an inner city rug rat running around doing stupid things, decided to send me to France in the summer of 1990. And Matthew's father, Francois, um, and I'm a French speaker, just so you know, um, since my family's Haitian. Matthew's father decided to take me and Matthew, three days into the trip, take me and Matthew around the country in his old 1983 Range Rover, and it changed my life. It totally changed my life. French food, French wine, French girls, French weed, French views, French castles, French landscape. It was just beautiful. And for an inner city kid like me, when I was 15 years old, I didn't know anything but running around the streets of Boston, taking the T, which is the public transit, and getting myself into trouble. So when I had all these experiences and feelings and emotions on that trip, that stuck with me. And I even wrote a journal. And I, uh, I don't know why I wrote a journal back then, but I did. And somehow I saved it. And just seeing what I wrote at the age of 15 is pretty interesting. I was saying things like, I didn't know life could feel this way. And I didn't know I can b- build relationships with people around the world. And I can speak other languages all the time, etc. So that felt good. So I'm going to fast forward to when I was 21, when I got out of college, um, By happenstance, I picked up the book Personal Finance for Dummies. I learned about passive income, which is essentially uh, you getting paid without physically having to be somewhere, right? It's, It's money that comes in from a passive source like real estate or a dividend stock or intellectual property. So here was my thought at age 21. I was like, man, if I could generate passive income, then I could create time. And if I can create time, I can go back to when I was 15 and keep traveling the world and having all those experiences, right? That's how it all came together. Um, Because when you get out of college or even when you're in high school, you know, everybody is presenting culture and being successful as you got to go to work, you got to get the biggest title, you got to get a mortgage, you got to buy stuff and have monthly payments, You add a few cars and some kids. You have some beers on Friday. You go to Costco and kid activities on Saturday. You recover on Sunday, and you do it until age 65 while socking money into a 401k. That was not my idea of life at all. So in 2002, I think I was 25 by that point, I I had definitely started reading books in libraries and things of that nature around real estate and money and business and credit and all that type of stuff. I got very intrigued and was could always be found in the Fairfax County, Virginia Library in Alexandria, Kingstown, Virginia on a Saturday in aisle six. That was my first mentor was aisle six. 
But in 2002, I created my own freedom plan and I used it for 25 years. I'm still using it in a way, but I used it for 25 years. Here's that plan, okay? It's 10 steps. I'm going to walk you through all of it right now. Number one, you got to give yourself a why. Whether it's family, lifestyle, living to the fullest, there's got to be a why behind you wanting to create your own financial freedom. Because if you're going to chase money, I'm telling you, money runs. There's got to be a greater why behind it. Number two, you got to stop buying unneeded stuff that forces you to work. Unfortunately, this, our society, uh, at least in the United States, pushes a lot of consumerism. We, we used to be a, uh, a society that would make a lot of things, and now we're a society that buys a lot of things. Every time we have a problem, some commercial on TV or some commercial through social media is telling you to go buy something to solve it. Well, the problem is every time we buy a new car, get a new house, more clothes, more this, more that, we're just adding more liabilities to our life, forcing us to work even more. It's a vicious cycle. So step two is stop buying unneeded stuff, forcing you to work. Step three, pay yourself first. The future you is your number one bill. Now, I think I picked that up from Robert Kiyosaki, Rich Dad, Poor Dad. I can't remember how and when, but I was very aware that it's really important to pay yourself first. I'll talk about that a little bit more in depth because I'm going to talk about a couple of these steps in depth later. But you've got to get in the habit of paying yourself first. Why is the cable bill more important than future you? It, it shouldn't be. Number four, you got to store money versus saving money. Okay, And when I say store money, it is technically saving money, but you're storing it. You're putting it away with the intent of when you have enough in storage to go buy something that will pay you. That's what that money is for. Okay, So you always store your money and you stay broke. You make your investing life easy and your day-to-day -day life hard. Even though I'm financially capable nowadays, sometimes I send so much money to storage that, believe it or not, I had a problem buying a, a plane ticket because I just didn't have enough cash available to do it. But that's okay because I have goals, and once money goes into storage, I don't steal from storage ever. Step five, you got to build up enough in storage to buy, buy an asset. The, the, the skill you got to think about is the habit of storing. It's not so much how much you get into storage at first. It's the habit of doing it. The habit and the mindset of knowing that you're going to store money to go out and buy an asset. And in the future, that asset will be paying you. The reason I got off Career Highway at age 46 is because I had bought 2,000 assets over the years. And they were paying me. And when it was time to leave my W-2 job, those assets were sending more than enough passive income for me to live off of. So step five is build up enough in storage to buy an asset. Step six, buy or create assets that pay you once you have enough in storage. It could be stocks, it could be real estate, you could build a business, etc. But you got to get assets. Assets are the things that pay us. Assets are the things that grow in value. Assets are the things that spit cash flow or build in equity so you can redeploy that equity and go get more assets over time. Step seven, when the asset pays you, store that income and add it to your paycheck and build your storage even more. So just because you buy a piece of real estate or you get some dividend stock, when that thing starts paying you, whether it's a dollar, ten dollars, a hundred dollars, a thousand, ten thousand dollars, you put you slam that money right back into storage. Why? Because step eight, as soon as you have another uh, another good water money in your storage, you buy another asset. Step nine, you press repeat. Step 10, you press repeat again. That's the freedom plan I used in my 20s to start buying condominiums or condos in the D.C. area. I started pretty much at age 26. The first condo that I bought was $90,000. Um, at the time of this recording, I'm 47. And I'm, like in the last 20 months or so, I've been part of a team that's bought five $25 million complexes in the last 19 months. So my knowledge has grown. My assets have grown. I consistently use paychecks plus self-education over time to just execute, execute, execute. And I was just boringly consistent. It was nothing special, right? So I'm not suggesting you do big real estate deals like me. That's not what I'm suggesting. I'm suggesting you build up the habit of paying yourself first to buy assets that pay you and then keep educating yourself on topics like how do I buy assets? How do I minimize my tax liability? When you go into career, the number one, one of the first things we should be thinking about is how do I work my way out of this career? There's nothing wrong with the career itself. I worked for 25 years. I've thoroughly enjoyed 
being an executive in corporate for 25 years, being a street cop for 15 years, being in the military for 22 years, but I always had my eye on the ball in terms of financial freedom. So in the show notes, uh, I'll post a newsletter that I wrote that has that 10-step plan there. Okay, And for those of you who are nerds like me on financial freedom, I'm going to talk a little bit about the mindset of steps three, four, five, and six. Okay, So step three, the pay yourself first, the future you is the number, number one bill. You've got to have that mentality. Future you has to be the number one bill. We are literally trained to get paid, pay our bills like gas and electric, go out with our friends, and then whatever is left over, we save it. You got to rewire that habit. As a priority in my 20s and 30s, when I was paid, I systematically, so automation is key, but I systematically sent large portions of my paycheck away for storage before I even looked at bills because future Maurice was the number one bill. Like if the gas bill was late, then it just had to wait until next month because future Maurice was always my number one priority, which means my family is my number one priority because I put myself in a position where I'm financially capable. I was priority. The gas company was not. And sometimes what that causes is you start feeling broke because you're always storing money, right? So if you have that broke feeling, good. That's the point. There's so many things taking money out of our pocket now in society. Think speed cameras and groceries and this and that. You have got to pay your future self first as a number one thing because the world is literally designed to take money from you. Just like I said, tolls, speed cameras, credit cards, dinner out. Before you let it, get rid of your money. Store it away for investing. Pay your future self first. All right, deep diving step four, storing money versus saving money. This is a a thing that people get confused for some reason, but it's a mindset shift, okay? You got to flip your mindset from I am saving money to I am storing money. Stored money is intentional money. That money is pending a date to be deployed where you can go out and buy an asset when you have enough for a down payment or whatever it is that you're going to buy. That's the purpose of storing it. Yes, you will sometimes feel broke, but I think that's what we want, right? It's kind of related to one of the tri life on principles that I talk about quite a bit, which is make your investing life easy and your day-to-day life hard. I struggled all the time with day-to-day things on my journey, but my storage kept growing. My storage account, which is literally a savings account, the one that I use now is lit- just a, it's a bank account at a small regional bank. Um, money gets transferred to it systematically every month. And here's the key. When money goes in, it goes in easy, but it's really hard for me to get that money out. I got no debit card on it. I got no linked transfer account out. For me to get it, I purposely have to call and request a form to wire it out. I made it very difficult for myself uh, to rob storage um, unless I am going out to buy an asset. Never steal from yourself. Never rob your storage. If you have a life need, like if something comes up, like medical or whatever... To the extent possible, wait for the next time that you get paid. Maybe you're not storing that month, but you're certainly not stealing from storage, right? All right, last deep dive, or two more deep dives. Deep dive on step five, which is build up enough in storage to buy an asset. So look, if I need $25,000 for down payment to buy an investment property, and I'm storing $2,500 a month, then it's going to take me 10 months to, to get it, right? It's simple as that. That money is for you to go buy that property or that, that asset. All right, Mo, I don't have the ability to store 2500 bucks a month. Great, but you might have the ability to store 25 bucks a month, 50 bucks a month, 300 bucks a month. So all we're talking about, the only variability we have is time. How committed are you to the process of storing your money until you have enough to buy your first property? Because when I started researching real estate at age 21, I didn't buy my first property until age 25. I saved that long to be able to afford the first property. So I kind of, when people are like, I don't have enough money, I'm like, no, you lack commitment to self. It's not about the money. It's about the habit of storing. And if it's going to take you five years to store it, then fine. Then that's what it's going to take. All right, last deep dive is step six. Buy and create assets that pay you. Look, you know, the asset that you buy, like I'm a real estate guy, but I'm not saying that everybody needs to be a real estate guy or girl. No, you can build a business, you can franchise something, you can buy stocks, you can focus on dividend stocks, you can buy gold. Whatever choice, whatever your choice is and whatever you want to buy, it's a personal choice, right? It's one that's driven by lifestyle-related goals. 
I chose real estate because of the cash flow. Like I live off real estate cash flow. I'm still living off the same cash flow that I had in 2014. Same properties, I still live off that cash flow. It doesn't mean you have to. You, you can choose a business. You can choose stocks, bonds, gold, Bitcoin. It doesn't matter. What matters is you've built the habit of storing money to buy or build assets, and you understand that future you is your number one bill and number one priority, right? Okay, so now what? What's the next step? Well, the level of income or equity you created depends on the time and effort you put into this whole thing. So I literally executed this 10-step plan for 25 years. Um, It took a long time, and as good things should take a long time, but there is no instant financial freedom. It just doesn't work that way. And even if, you're gonna, even if you win the lottery, great. You've won $10 million. I bet you you're wasted because you've not, you've not built up the skill set and the tenacity to know how to maintain that money or grow it. You've got to get into this rhythm of getting paid, paying your future self first, storing, buying assets, understanding how to operate those assets. When that asset spits a little bit of money or it goes up in equity, you... Uh, put that right back into storage and you go go get another one, right? I hope that is helpful. That was um, my 10-step plan. I started using it in 2002 when I was 25 years old. It's been 26 years, and here's my results. It took me seven years for more income than expenses, so that was 2008. Like, I had more passive income coming in than I had bills, like basic bills, food, water, shelter. But life changed when I covered my basic needs, Right? Because I was in total control as my basic needs were met by me, not having to rely on an employer, but I still worked for an employer. But I have to tell you this, that once your basic needs are covered, life opens up in a way that's not easily explainable. You just have to get there. So it took me seven years to get to that point. It took me 14 years, so we're talking 2014, uh, it took me 14 years to generate more income from real estate than I was generating from work. 14 years. Now, nowadays, it can be done way faster. I was inefficient. There's more resources available. Google wasn't around when I started. There was no social media to connect with like-minded people and partner on stuff like this. I went the very inefficient route of buying condos as much as I could, and then when some appreciated, like I got up to 35 condos. Some of them appreciated, so I sold the ones that appreciated, and I paid off all the other ones. And in 2014, I ended up with uh, 18 paid off homes generating about 160 grand of income a year. So that was pretty good. But now it's year 26. So it's, it's, we're in 2023. It's, it's been 26 years since I started my process. My assets essentially buy assets now. I don't work for anybody anymore. I do have my own company relative to buying apartment complexes and stuff like that. That's a little bit different. But whenever my assets create money, whenever, let's say, I sell an apartment complex or receive cash flow or whatever, I still store it. And when that money gets to a certain level in storage, I'm either paying off loans with it or I'm buying a new asset. I've never changed my process. And if you're wondering, over that 25 years, my average salary was $80,000. Okay, So it's not like I was making gobs and gobs of money. When I started in corporate, I was making thirty seven five. That was 1997. And when I got out of corporate in 2021, I was making around two hundred grand. But the overall average was around 80K, but th- those are my results on an average of 80K. So how will your financial freedom plan work for you? Um, I don't know. And I hope your mindset is starting to shift a little bit. When I got into work, I realized that my job after I got my diploma in college was to go get a salary. And then once I started reading books, I realized that my job was to take that salary and create streams of income with it. And that, my friends... That is what I wanted to get across to you. The fact that one of the things we need to be thinking about is how to break the money rat race. I am not dependent on anyone for anything. I'm not saying I have a gazillion dollars coming in on a monthly basis, but I have more than enough to live my way. I don't think you need to be a millionaire or billionaire to live life well. I think people actually want the lifestyle that they think millionaires and billionaires have. And to have that, all you need is more passive income than expenses, And maybe a little bit more on top of that so you can live well and time. And once you have those two factors, you are golden. You are out there trying life on, living your way, plugging into planet and earth as intended. And that's what I am doing right now as I record this. I'm actually in Beirut, Lebanon today, looking over my favorite Mediterranean view, 
spending time trying to get you guys information in Try Life on Land, and I hope this has been helpful. I will put the newsletter that, that articulates this in the show notes so you can click on that link and watch the newsletter. And if you have any questions, just reach out to me at maurice at trylifeon.com or go to trylifeon.com, uh, the website itself, and send me a message through there. I will get it. I appreciate you guys, and I hope you find this useful. I love getting you information that helps you try life on your way. All right. Peace, family. We hope this episode was insightful and brought value to your day. If so, please be awesome and leave us a five-star review. Find out how Team Quattro can help you at thequattroway.com and scroll down for more info. Until next time, this is the Real Estate Runway Podcast.